Okay, so um, <clears throat> my name is uh, Carl Chapman. I uh, run a little wildlife tour company based in North Norfolk called Wildlife Tours and Education. And I've been running that now for about, uh, about 14 years. Um, we do trips mainly around Norfolk, uh, but also into neighboring counties, Cambridgeshire, Suffolk, Lincolnshire. Uh, and once every month, I do a trip um, away uh, in the UK. So that might be Shetland, it might be uh, the north of Scotland, it could be the Isles of Scilly, it could be anywhere really. Um, but basically I've been doing that now for uh, quite a number of years. Uh, when, uh, when people started coming on the tours initially, uh, quite a number of them, a uh, uh, number of people started bringing cameras with them and uh, I soon found out that not many of them knew how to use it. So I started teaching wildlife photography uh, by way of day courses, and that's something else that I do. I also um, <clears throat> do some work for AFON. I'm a mentor for a focus on nature. If you've not heard of AFON um, and you've got young members or young family members that are interested in wildlife, it's something for uh, for young adults up to 25 years of age um, to, that gives assistance to them um, by way of mentoring uh, to get them into nature orientated employment. So uh, I've got a, a couple of people uh, on my books, so to speak, at the moment, uh, who one's a photographer. Uh, and the other one is setting up a, a more or less a wildlife tour business similar to mine in Devon. So uh, they uh, good luck to them. Um, and that's the idea of AFON. I also uh, am a former chair, uh, chaired the, um, for the last four years, the Norfolk and Norwich Naturalist Society, one of the oldest naturalist societies uh, in the UK and certainly the oldest within Norfolk. Um, and I now chair the Liaison Committee, which looks at sort of planning issues around the county that may affect wildlife and so on. Um, you may have heard of the Norfolk and Norwich Naturalist Society uh, by way of some of the publications that it produces, uh, the main one of which is the Bird and Mammal Report. Anyone interested in wildlife in Norfolk um, should really uh, get a copy of the Bird and Mammal Report. The easiest way of doing that is to become a member. So, um, I also am Norfolk Citation Recorder. I fell into this uh, role a number of years ago. Um, but basically, every taxa within the, uh, within the county has a recorder. Uh, and it enables all the wildlife to be, um, all the records that people send in to be um, gathered together uh, so that we know exactly what we've got in the county. I look after citations. And I'm also um, a founding director of McNag, uh, which is a, a new uh, community interest company um, with the uh, con conservation of the seas off Norfolk at its heart, uh, Marine Conservation for Norfolk Action Group. <clears throat> I'm also a marine mammal medic with British Divers Marine Life Rescue. Now, my days of, of um, wrestling with seals on beaches are long gone, uh, but I do, uh, I do help them with uh, the educational side of things from time to time and uh, holding public back when uh, a whale breaches on the shore and so on. Um, but I do do some work with Sea Watch Foundation as well. I'm the regional coordinator and have been for about 10 years, uh, collating records and uh, organising sea watches. But principally, and most importantly, um, I see myself as an ornithologist uh, and in fact uh, qualified as such. Uh, birds are my first love. Uh, and they remain at the heart of, of what I'm involved with. So, this uh, this is a uh, Havergate Marshes in, in winter. is a, part of a suite of talks and walks, as Andrew alluded to, 
looking at the wildlife of uh, Havergate marshes through the seasons. And tonight's talk looks at, at what we may find in winter. And principally at this time of the year, it's going to be mammals and birds. And I might just add, if you are coming on the walk on uh, on Sunday, it ain't going to be as muddy as that uh, picture shows there because Andrew's got special permission to uh, to go on a, a concrete path, which is not a public footpath, but he's got permission for us to go on it. So uh, it may not be... Uh, Wellingtons all the way that are, that are needed. Um, when Andrew and I went uh, went down to uh, inspect the thing and do a risk assessment of the area, um, we were slipping and sliding all over the place, and I didn't really want that. So uh, we uh, we managed to get the, uh, the the sort of concrete option available, but it doesn't take anything away from what we'll see. Uh, and what will we see? Well, one of the uh, one of the uh, things that we will see are principally mammals uh, and birds. Uh, and one of the six species of deer that we've got in the UK, um, this is a, a Chinese water deer. Uh, this was uh, a photograph taken on Halvergate Marsh, native to uh, China and Korea. Um, they stand, if you've never seen one, they stand just about uh, half a metre tall at the shoulder. They, they don't have a long life, these things. They're not very big. They live about six years in the wild. And they were brought into the UK in about 1870. And they were released uh, or escaped from Whipson Head Zoo in about 1930, 1929, 1930. But they love rebed and river edges and... Uh, the edges of fields and woodlands, and, and therefore Avergate is just ideal for these things, and they've spread through East Anglia. Um, they eat um, nutritious plants and herbs, occasionally grasses and sedges. They don't eat trees or tree bark, um, which sort of sets them apart uh, from Reeves Muntjac. Um, one of the, the or the other small deer that we've got in the area, um, muntjac can be quite um, destructive. If you've ever had one through your garden, you may know that um, they'll uh, they'll take the tops off the bulbs in spring um, as uh, as soon as anything. Um, but not not so uh, the uh, Chinese water deer. They they will take the root the tops off uh, winter root crops if other food is scarce, but they principally love sort of uh, plants and herbs. So they, they're quite benign uh, in that respect. The males have a, a pair of tusks and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to sort of have a look at these on Sunday um, when, uh, when we've, I'm almost certain that we're going to see one of these things or maybe more um, because they're, they're now sort of forming pairs up from sort of mid-January up until about April, they'll start to uh, to pair up and defend the territory. So we should uh, we should start to see one or two about, and maybe we can see the uh, the male with his retractable tusks. They sit low in the gum, or they fold them back into the gum, but they they use these tusks to uh, defend territories against other males, stand the ground, in other words. Another animal that we may uh, we may see out there is the brown hare, um, two to four year lifespan on a brown hare. Um, I always thought that uh, brown hares were indigenous to the British Isles, but they're not. Uh, they were introduced after the, or before, should I say, the rabbit uh, was brought over uh, from Spain. Um, and they were brought by the Romans. Uh, so they're not indigenous to us. They're an introduced species. They don't dig burrows. Uh, they lie in forms. And if we're very careful, again, on Sunday, we will, we will see one or two of these laid flat in fields. And those black-tipped ears do give them away quite easily. They breed any time of the year, but mainly January to October. 
So uh, again, they uh, they can have leverage even now. 43 days gestation period and two to three leverets are born. Uh, quite often, um, two to three don't survive. Uh, more often than not, only one gets through to adulthood. So um, another mammal that we might see out on the marsh uh, are these guys, otter. I'm quite surprised, actually, that a number of people that I take out and they think that, that Britain has two species of otter. It doesn't. Uh, they think that the, the sea otter uh, that perhaps we get out on mull that you see sort of pictures of and so on is different to the otter here in the lowlands. It's not. It's the same species. And they've got a sort of five to ten year lifespan and they will eat anything. I've seen sort of um, uh, otter take chickens, uh, goldfish, uh, ducks, mallard, uh, as well as very, very large fish. So um, they, they are um, killing machines, really, uh, despite them being uh, very well thought about and loved by the British public. Um, you can always tell when otters have been around because of their sprint, their, uh, their dung, and it's, <clears throat> it smells, to me anyway, of jasmine tea. So if you stick a stick in it, a poke a stick in there, you know, just smell at the stick. It smells of jasmine tea, quite sweet. So moving away from the mammals then onto the birds. This is uh, one of the first birds we'll see. It's a little grebe, and they collect in big numbers on the rivers uh, at Havergate um, in winter. Uh, very different to the to the chestnut summer plumage that these birds have. So they're quite small and they'll duck down and go in the reeds at the first opportunity if they're disturbed. Another grebe that we've, uh, we've got in winter here on the marsh is the great crested grebe. Uh, very different to the summer plumage, which uh, I've got a little insert there, you can see that. Very different indeed, but it still retains that line from the bill to the eye. The laws, that's the uh, official term for that. So it's, um, well, again, hopefully we may see one of those if we get down to the river at some point. Cormorant, a fisherman's enemy. Um, often on the marshes, there's just a, a, a something that's, that's quite interesting with, with cormorants. There are two subspecies, two different subspecies. Um, and I don't mean um, by that shags and cormorants. Shags are a different species completely. They very rarely come down to East Anglia. We get them occasionally, and they'll come down from the Isles of May or the Farne Islands or, or whatever. And we'll quite often see them here, where I'm based, just down the road in Cromer. Um, but I'm talking about the cormorants rather than shags. There are two different subspecies. And I've just done a, a bit of an insert here for you so that you can see the difference. The one on the left is a carbo, uh, which is its, uh, its Latin suffix. Um, uh, and that basically is the British cormorant. And you can see that it has a, um, a gape line that sort of drops forward of the eye. Whereas sinensis, which is the continental cormorant, has a gape line that drops down behind the eye. Not easy, but it's got a bigger gulgular patch. Uh, and the Photograph of the cormorant you can see there, in fact, is Sinensis, the con continental cormorant, which uh, <clears throat> you will struggle these days to find a British cormorant outside of Wales or Scotland. And that's because Sinensis has gradually approached and replaced Carbo uh, in East Anglia and on the marshes uh, simply by way of it. Uh, because it's from a warmer climate, it breeds earlier than the British cormorant. 
And it also breeds uh, maybe has two broods in the year, whereas the British Common would only have one. So it gets the prime breeding sites and it, uh, it's more prolific. So in eventuality, what's happened is by stealth, uh, Sinensis, the continental cormorant, has pushed out, moved away the carbor, um, the, the British cormorant, and now you've, you've really got to go to Scotland and out to Wales to actually see that. It's just something that, uh, that basically is quite interesting, the way that these things have developed. Grey heron. Um, people are quite surprised to, to learn that a uh, grey heron will have a 25 year lifespan. Uh, uh, and it's not uncommon on the marshes. Another heron species, or another couple of heron species, uh, the little egret on the left with the dark bill and the yellow feet, and the great white egret with the dark legs, and in fact, it's got black feet and the yellow bill. So they've sort of uh, reverse colors, if you like. Um, when these, if, if any sort of um, person who's been out on this marsh for any number of years will know that these are uh, recent immigrants and little egrets started to uh, invade, let's say, the, uh, the UK. They started to move north as a result of increasing temperatures uh, from the continent. And I remember in 1990, I think it was, when I uh, first saw my uh, first little egret, I remember running to see it. Well, I wouldn't do that now. A uh, great white egret is starting to, uh, starting to move north too. And in fact, both species now breed in north. Uh, so it's not... Um, an unlikely event that we would come across one on Sunday. Mute swan, uh, resident species uh, with the uh, all the black around and up to the eye on the bill. A whooper swan, uh, which again uh, occurs from time to time out at Halvigate. Uh, is uh, the whooper swan has this big, nice, thick wedge of uh, yellow on the bill. And it uh, summers in Iceland and comes down to us for the winter. The, uh, the patterning, the black patterning on the bill is unique to each bird. And in fact, uh, Peter Scott of the... Um, uh, of uh, the Wildlife and sort of um, Wetlands Trust fame, uh, drew uh, swans and identified them each year as they returned to the same space. He drew the bill patterns, so it's uh, he could identify them when they returned. Uh, gave them all names. Another uh, winter swan that we've got is this little guy. Is uh, the Buick swan. A lot less yellow on the bill, you can see that. And in fact, they're very much straighter and shorter necked. It's a smaller swan. But it's that reduced amount of, uh, of yellow. Uh, these guys breed in, in Arctic Russia. And they come down to us via the Baltic states. Um, and interestingly enough, um, on the last uh, survey that was done on this about 10 years ago, 34% were, were had lead shot embedded in their, their body tissues. So these guys uh, do endure the guns when they come in to and from us each winter. A bird that, uh, that does get swelled in winter, uh, numbers do get swelled in winter from by birds coming in from the north, uh, is the grey lag goose. You can tell it's a grey lag by these uh, the orange bill, mainly semi-feral now. A lot of these birds don't migrate away. Um, many have just lost the urge to migrate. Uh, feeding is so good here on agricultural land and so on. 
And again, this is a bird with dead certainty that we will see on Sunday. Another winter goose is, is this guy, uh, the uh, pink-footed goose. This is my, my alarm clock every morning. Uh, pink-footed geese fly over here on the north north, of course. Um, they've got uh, pink legs, and you can see that dark head and neck there. And the bill itself, uh, big flocks, the bill itself is, uh, is sort of pink and black. So this guy comes down from, uh, from the north each year. One resident goose that we've got that's managed to find a bit of a niche here now is the Egyptian goose, which is uh, a resident of the Nile, which escaped from collections and so on. And uh, the first breeding record in, uh, in the UK was in the 1700s, so they've been here quite a while. And in Norfolk, there are now 900 breeding pairs. Uh, so it's, uh, it's found a niche and it's taking advantage of it. Brent goose. Uh, there are, in fact, uh, these are dark bellied Brent geese. Uh, these come in from Russia and uh, come down to south and eastern England. They, uh, occasionally we do get uh, this race of uh, Brent goose, and this is a pale bellied Brent goose. You can see the bellies are a lot paler, not dark. The flanks are a lot paler too. In fact, worldwide, there are six different races of this goose. Uh, and we get four of them uh, regularly each year uh, in Norfolk. Seldom find V formation, but they do come down in family groups. And it's quite interesting to see and watch these, uh, these birds out on the marshes when they get together. And you can almost see mum, dad and the two kids, you know. Interesting to watch. Uh, I just pop this one in. You obviously know what it is. It's a mallard. Uh, we've got uh, 100,000 breeding pairs in, uh, in Britain. Um, but numbers swell up to about three quarters of a million in winter. And these come down from uh, Arctic Russia. So we get a lot of wintering birds here in the UK. This is, um, this is an interesting little duck. Um, this is a, a gadwall. It's not a common duck. Uh, there are about 1,200 breeding pairs in the UK, and, and we get about 25,000 wintering. But it's, uh, it's a, it's a grey duck, you might say, but that sort of patterning on it really does sort of make it stand out as a very, very beautiful, uh, beautiful bird. Lots of white in the wing when it flies, so they're quite easy to pick up uh, when they do fly. As is this, this is a marsh area, quite easy to pick out. Um, people get uh, marsh areas and buzzards mixed up quite often because they both fly uh, with their wings held up high in a shallow V. But the marsh area is a much longer tail. Uh, longer, thinner wings. The uh, the buzzard is a much stockier bird uh, with a shorter tail. In the UK, we've uh, we've now got about four hundred pairs and uh, seventy six pairs in Norfolk, and certainly there's a few pairs down on Hothergate marshes. It's always difficult with uh, with marsh areas to to sort of. Um, Estimate how many pairs you've got because one male will serve a couple of nests. You'll have a couple of females in tow. This is a male, by the way, with that tricolored wing, the brown, grey, and black. Red kite becoming even commoner now. That lovely fork tail. Um, the UK has about uh, 4,600 pairs now. Breeding. It got down to uh, 
the last female in Wales in the 1950s. So it's a reintroduction success story. And it's got very, very loose wings when it flies. Um, very sort of uh, almost slow motion wing beats. Beautiful bird to watch. We've got about, well, it's recorded as 28 pairs breeding in Norfolk, but I'm sure that the numbers are overlooked and we've got more than that. I just put this slide in here. This is a, a on the left is a common buzzard. And again, um, get those down on the marsh. All buzzards, by the way, have that uh, dark mark on the on the carpal, on the, the bend in the wing there. They're, all buzzards have that uh, a dark mark there. And the right hand bird, in fact, is a rough leg buzzard. So the the common buzzard uh, on the left is is a resident. Uh, breeding resident, and numbers are swelled by um, birds coming in off the continent in winter. But the uh, the bird on the right, the rough leg buzzard, is in fact a, a winter visitor, uh, and they occur here as an eruptive uh, species. So when the um, the lemming crop fails in uh, Arctic Russia and, uh, and Arctic Scandinavia, these birds will move south, some of which come across the North Sea to us. Not in huge numbers, uh, but I have seen them on Avogate Marsh. It's not seen one this year down there uh, because it's not uh, what you would call a, a rough leg buzzard year this year. There's only been one or two spotted in Norfolk. But in some instances, some years, you do get quite uh, quite big numbers. And you can tell the difference that the rough leg buzzard is a bigger bird, and it's got uh, it's got a white rump and tail, uh, which is not sort of uh, very evident from this photograph. Um, but it also always has that black belly, which is not always uh, evident on the uh, on the common buzzard. The reason they're called rough leg buzzards, by the way, is they've got um, They've got uh, feathered legs because they're from the Arctic. And you can see that uh, in the right hand photograph here. This is one that I, I took uh, just up the, just across the road, actually, near the mill, near Stacey Mill. Um, or it was on a, a hay bale and it had just eaten a rat. And uh, the, you can quite easily see how the, all the tarsi, all the the legs are feathered right down to the feet. And that's why they're called rough leg buzzard. And the left hand photograph I've included that so you can see the, the white rump on the uh, on the rough leg. And that was on Avogate Marshes. Um, a bird that we'll almost certainly see is Kestrel. I've included two pictures here for you so you can see the difference between the female on the left and the male on the right. Uh, if you look at the crowns, of the bird uh, on the top of the head, the female's got this nice brown crown, whereas the, the male has this gray crown. And also you can see the, uh, the underside of the tail on each bird there. It's nice and barred on the, uh, the female, but it's just got this thick black terminal bar on the male. So uh, quite, a, uh, quite a difference between them. Um, habitually hover, of course, which leads has led to them being termed in Old English hoverkite. That's what they were termed. Um, a bird that people often get confused with kestrel is, is this guy, this is Sparrowhawk. Um, and you can see the barring on the chest. I'll go back to the kestrel. And you can see the, uh, the lining on the chest, the sort of dashes on the chest compared with the, the cross barring on the Sparrowhawk. And... Uh, it has a, a, a unique uh, flight, uh, the sparrowhawk. It's um, a flat, flat glide, whereas the, uh, the kestrel will never do that. It will always, uh, the, the terminology is winnow. It's uh, quite a shallow uh, flight. And again, we may see one of these out on the marshes uh, on, uh, on Sunday. The, um, the easiest way of telling them apart at distance, by the way, is the kestrel always has a two-tone upper wing. You can see that on the uh, on the bird on the left here. 
it's got sort of darker uh, ends to the wings, the primaries, whereas the inner part of the wing is more chestnut coloured. So there's quite a, um, a contrast between the, the outer and inner wing on a kestrel, whereas it's concolorous all the way to the edge of the wing uh, on, a, on a sparrowhawk. And in fact, a peregrine, a merlin and a hobby as well. Uh, but they're summer birds. We're not seeing any of those. Um, not seeing any hobbies out on the marshes this this week, anyway. A couple of birds that we'll uh, we'll see in the ditches and so on. Uh, moorhen that you'll be familiar with on the left, and the uh, the coot on the right here. The uh, the moorhen has a, a reddish shield, whereas the uh, the coot always has a white shield. When Andrew and I went down uh, the other week, uh, we saw quite a number of uh, lapwing. Uh, most of them were flying over. We get them in big flocks down there this time of the year. Um, they're mainly a moorland nesting species. They do nest here in Norfolk in small numbers. Uh, but that magnificent crest there, this one's, uh, this one's a female. The crest is a little bit longer in the male. And another moorland species, which uh, is often associated with the lapwing, is the golden plover, again in big flocks. This is its winter plumage. In summer, all that belly and the neck and sometimes even the head is, uh, the face anyway, is, is completely jet black. So uh, depending on where the birds are from, the, the black goes further up the bird, the further north they've come from. So when they first arrive, it's possible to say, tell how far north they've come from. But on a wintering bird in, in this sort of plumage, it would be impossible. Oyster catcher, uh, another moorland breeding species, they, although they do breed locally. And uh, you can see I've put this picture in. It's not a, a very good picture, but it does show the, uh, the white collar. And I hope you can see that. Uh, underneath the, the chin there, that white chin strap. Uh, and that's a, a, a winter plumage feature. It loses that in summer breeding plumage. Curlew, another moorland breeding species. And this bird is in, uh, in trouble. Uh, between 1994 and 2010, there's been a 46% reduction. I'll say those dates again, 1994 to 2010, 46% reduction. So you're looking in the last sort of 25 years, we've lost more or less half the, uh, the population of this bird. Uh, and that's why there's uh, moves afoot to try and uh, bolster numbers up again. And um, there are several schemes on the go, and some of them uh, are in East Anglia, uh, in Norfolk, in fact, um, to, uh, to try and help numbers climb back up a little bit. Another bird that you uh, quite don't often see like this when you're out walking on the marshes, more often than not, you'll, uh, you'll almost tread on it and, and flush it out. Uh, this is a snipe. Um, when, when numbers start to sort of get together, a collective noun, a wisp, a wisp of snipe, lovely word, wisp. Uh, very cryptic plumage. They'll sit tight until uh, they're disturbed, and then they'll grunt as they take off and uh, and fly off into the distance. This was uh, this was the bird that got me into bird watching because it's uh, it has a a wonderful spring display. But I'll not talk about that now. We'll talk about that in the uh, in the spring uh, presentation. This is a jacksnipe. This is uh, the sort of smaller um, relative, if you like, of the, uh, the common snipe. And these birds will sit exceptionally tight. Um, I don't know if any of you watched uh, Winter Watch, uh, but there was an article on there about jack snipe and, and uh, the guy had a night scope uh, and was, uh, was sort of walking across the marsh trying to uh, to locate jack snipe uh, and was almost treading on them um, 
before he managed to throw a net over them so he could ring them. Um, but they are a beautiful bird. When you do see them and, and they're out in the open, they have this unusual habit of bouncing. Now, a lot of water birds do this, like wagtails and so on, dippers. Uh, but they really do bounce down there, really give it some uh, some dancing. So I want to uh, want to talk about gulls now, the sort of gulls that we might find out on the marsh in winter. This is the new kid on the block. This is a Mediterranean gull, a completely white wings um, in winter. Um, well, in summer too, but uh, in winter it, it has this sort of smudge behind the eye. In summer, it's got a completely black head. Um, but it's uh, we've got one of the best wintering areas just down the road between the piers on Great Yarmouth Beach. If you want to see a um, you want to see a, a good collection of various Mediterranean gulls, get on the beach at Great Yarmouth between the piers at this time of the year, and you'll and take a little bit of bread with you and throw it about, and you'll uh, you'll have a load of Mediterranean gulls around you, 40, 50, 60, 70 birds. Uh, is not that unusual. Some of them will be ringed, and you can find out where the birds are from. Um, but uh, German birds, French birds, um, are, are quite regular uh, in wintering around the Great Yarmouth area, and some of them do spill out over onto uh, Hothergate Marsh. Herringle, uh, that big bill with the red spot, you'll all be familiar with this bird. This is a five-year gull, unlike the Mediterranean gull, which is a two-year gull. A two-year gull takes uh, two years to mature into adult plumage. A herring gull, in fact, takes five years to mature into adult plumage. So it ends up with 10 plumages, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, and so on. Uh, so 10 different plumages to get to maturity. It's a big gull, a big gull. And there will undoubtedly be one or two of these kicking around uh, on the marsh on Sunday. This is a black-headed gull. Um, the, um, the blackhead is lost in winter, as you may know. Um, and uh, you can tell these birds uh, at any season, at any age, and almost at any distance. Uh, if you look at the right-hand photograph, you'll see that the, uh, the forewing has these white feather shafts on the leading edge. And that stands out like a sore thumb when you're watching a bird at distance. Uh, so it's quite easy to tell apart from other gulls because no other gull has that uh, those that white leaning edge to the uh, the, the outer form. Common gull, very benign and peaceful look. No red spot on the bill. You can see that. Numbers. Uh, increase here in winter, and then birds uh, move back to Scotland uh, and the uh, Scandinavia where they breed. It's quite a cute gull, a smallish gull, two-year gull, so it uh, reaches maturity in two years. This is a uh, this is an overlooked bird. I always think pigeons are a little bit overlooked, really, but this is a uh, pigeon family anyway. This is a stock dove. It doesn't have the, the white patches on the neck like the wood pigeon or white in the wings even like the wood pigeon. Uh, it's got these beautiful iridescent green patches on the neck, double black wing bar. And when they fly, they've they've it's almost as though child's drawn them they've got a black outline to the wing again quite a beautiful bird skylark just starting to uh, to come into uh, song i heard one uh, today so mild today um that uh, a little bit of sun came out and up on the local heath one of these things was singing away um, but the call, and I'll endeavour to uh, to sort of just sh show you. This is the call, particularly in flight. It's 
quite sharp. Now, if we uh, if we go to this bird, this is a meadow pipit, and we will see some of these on the marsh again, I'm sure. Um, I'd just like to, uh, they're quite often mistaken for skylarks. They're not a slimmer bird, uh, but they've got a different flight call, different call completely. Just like you to listen to this. Not as rough, a lot sharper, thinner call. That's the meadow pipi. Pied wagtail. Um, you'll be quite familiar with these birds. I always find it fun uh, trying to work out whether they're male or female, and I'll cover that in the uh, in the spring, the spring session. Not as easy as it sometimes appears, but uh, we do get another uh, wagtail. Um, sometimes we get it in winter, and that's the. Uh, the white wagtail, which is uh, in fact the same species, uh, it's just a different subspecies. Um, but the solid flanks on, on this bird, on the pied wagtail, distinguish it from that uh, subspecies. Another bird here, stone chant. I'm sure there'll be one or two of these out on the marsh. So cold because of the, uh, the their call resembles two stones tapped together. And uh, if you do get near a nest site or whatever, they will, uh, they'll let you know about it. Um, sips the top anything. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not a shy bird. It will, uh, it will sit up for you when you're watching it. Unlike this bird, uh, which is a Chetty's warbler. It was uh, not recorded in the UK until 1961 uh, when it turned up at uh, a place called Titchfield Haven in Hampshire. Uh, but now it's spread. It's another one of these birds that's, uh, that's moved north with the temperature contours. Uh, it's, got a, uh, it's got as far north now as Northumberland. Quite an explosive song. It says its name, Chetty, Chetty, Chetty. Uh, very rarely see it, but quite often hear it. And again, we should uh, maybe hear one of these out on the marshes on Sunday. Black cap, a fruity little song, a chat like call at this time of the year. So it's a uh, very chat, chat. Uh, they do overwinter. Uh, there was one out on the, uh, the marsh chacking away in the distance when, uh, when Andrew and I went out the other week. So there's one about, hopefully it might uh, show itself for us. And uh, in, in, they do with the mild winter that we've had, it was hardly surprising really to come across it. Starlings, um, in good numbers, out on the marsh, I'm sure. Um, some of you may know that you can, uh, you can sex these birds. Um, this time of the year, they're starting to, uh, to adopt a breeding plumage that more often than not in winter, they've got a, a, a dark bill, a black bill, like you can see on the tip of this bird. But as it starts to, uh, to get to sort of mid February or early February, the, the bill turns this horn color, this uh, yellow color. And at the base of that, uh, bill, you can see that this is slightly pink. It's also a, a like a pastel pink colour. It's a female, and if you uh, look at the male, it's got a pastel blue colour at the base of the bill. So these birds that um, hopefully visit your garden, it's common garden visiting, you'll be able to sex them if you don't already. It again as we leave the church on Sunday, we'll. Uh, We'll hear, maybe even see these. And you can sex these as well. 
Interesting. This one's a, uh, a female. That little blue collar that runs around the neck is quite thin on this bird. The, the cap is not fully cobble blue as it would be on a male. Uh, and in fact, they've got a, a, a little um, breast stripe on the male, uh, but that's absent on the female. Great tit, again, around the church area. The insects, these two, this is a, a female bird. The, uh, the black stripe down the belly on a great tit is a lot thicker and a lot blacker on a male. It will fill the area between the legs. The male's got more between his legs, shall we say. We'll put it to you like that. And a bird that uh, I've yet to see but I've heard down at Havergate, and that's the bearded tit. It's a, a specialist reed bed occupant. It's got a metallic ping ping call. They're beautiful birds. This one's a male. The uh, the females lack that mustachial stripe that this one's got. But they are very, very beautiful birds. As is the goldfinch. And uh, this is a Niger seed specialist. If you were feeding your birds at the weekend for the big garden bird watch and you put some Niger seeds out, chances are you had goldfinch in the garden. And again, these should be uh, on the field margins down at Harbourgate. I'm sure we'll see big flocks in winter. And that more or less sums up what I wanted to, uh, to tell you and what to expect from the Martian winter.